everyone. I'm Megan McCarthy, editor of Sign Africa. Thank you for joining us for our State of the Industry in 2021 webinar, proudly sponsored by Falcon, Fujifilm, Midcom, and Roland. We'll focus on current trends in the signage and printing industry, as well as share results from surveys sent out to readers, asking them what they expect from suppliers. So I'd like to welcome and introduce our panelists, uh, Dev Devandra Nyka from Falcon, Rob Mackinson from Midcom, Grant Portkita from Fujifilm, and Bob Glenister from Roland. Just some house rules, if you have any questions for the panelists, please post these in the Q&A section. Uh, please also take our poll that has been, that I've just launched. So the Q&A should be open. And um, yeah, so you're welcome to post your questions in there. And I think we can basically dive right in. So Devandra, I'm gonna start with you. Which industry sectors have experienced an increase in demand over the last year? You can just unmute yourself. Um, specifically from the signage perspective and the signage industry, I think um, the biggest demand around COVID related products was the, like the rest of the world, everyone reacted uh, spontaneously during April, May, June, July last year. It was all about what could we do from social distancing, try and create some type of protection. And if you look at demand for acrylic screens, demand for woven materials, those were all things that had a huge increase and became the trend at the time to try and have simple protection uh, measures put in place to help protect people and help contain the virus at the time. I think that was the biggest demand created around um, COVID last year. Um, in those initial four, four to five months. Post that, a lot of it has been now about brand and direct mail and direct marketing around trying to get customer confidence and trying to get the buyer to be aware that there's still life post COVID. And the only way they've been able to do that is either digital media or through direct mail, mail channel type of email campaigns. Thank you. And then Rob, I'm going to ask the next question to you. Um, what are the key industry trends for 2021? Um, just unmute yourself, Rob. We gauge this very much on, on ongoing discussions with, with, with customers, obviously. Um, R&D development, certainly on our side from our supply seems to be ongoing. So in terms of new product introductions, new product announcement, we really don't expect much different this year from, from any previous year. Trade shows is a, a bit of a, an issue in terms of putting these products out to market. But in general, the discussions we have with customers and coming through the, the COVID year, it's all about sustainability as a, as a business. And, and that sustainability applies to the, to the business in, in order to keep it profitable and, and hopefully maintain certain staff levels but also the sustainability environment. So we see tremendous trends in Europe in terms of moving towards more sustainable um, products in, in the signage and printing in the printing industries. And that covers both ink technologies and media um, technologies as well. Um, sustainability of the print business is all about making the right choices. And to some extent, pegging your costs of production to ensure profitability. Um, the trend in Europe and the buzzword in Europe that we've heard a couple of times, obviously from HP, but also from other sources, is that usership is the new ownership. If you just look at uh, purchasing trends in Europe around things like motor vehicles, very few people buy motor vehicles. They will take full maintenance leases, um, which means they have fixed costs for the period of using that motor vehicle. They hand it back and they take the next model. So we do see a bit of a shift in buying patterns in, in Europe. And again, this is from... Um, information gained from HP primarily, that people don't really want to own the asset anymore. They want to pay to use the, the machine, particularly assets that have a fairly short product life cycle like printers. If you're looking at more sustainable and longer term products like cutters, you might argue you want that on your balance sheet as an asset. So there's a big move towards people wanting to, to be able to pay for the use of a product without necessarily owning the product and getting into those nasty discussions at the end of life about trading values, 
with the various suppliers. So we see a lot of trend towards that. OPEX driving the purchase of a printer as an OPEX expense rather than a, a CAPEX expense. Um, and we're trying desperately to see if there's contractual models that can be put together much like the copy industry to provide printers into the printing industry based on a, on a pay per use or cost per click basis, not only the running costs, but including the machine itself. So I think that's a trend that's happening in Europe already, um, whether we'll take a year or two or three years to follow that, um, that'll depend on, on, on various factors, not the least of which is the bank's willingness to, to lend money in those situations, which I'll touch on in one of the other points. So technology wise, I don't see much further than what's already happening, but it's more around businesses doing everything they need to sustain themselves uh, in this sort of upswing back to, back to normality. Great, thanks Rob. Um, so Grant, I'm gonna uh, go to you with the next question. Are there still concerns over China's supply chain and I would say probably overseas in general? Megan, uh, probably the one question I was hoping you wouldn't ask me today because <laughs> You know, as uh, as Fujifilm, we're not uh, we're not deeply sort of affected by by the China supply chain. Um, as you may or may not be aware, we've always got factories all over the world: the US, the UK, Europe, um, uh, Japan, and China. So um, we're not um, easily affected by that. So so maybe for the sake of the audience, uh, perhaps it's better that I pass this on to one of the other one of my other colleagues on this on this call. And Devendra, that's what I was thinking. It might be an answer. Uh, something that you could possibly answer a little bit easier, but um, yeah, unfortunately, Megan, I'd love to, I'd love to give more input there, but um, I'd be lying probably. So. Okay, no problem. <laughs> I'm to out there, Grant. <laughs> um, yeah, I think the China d dilemma is affecting not just us in the printing and signage industry. Globally, all supply chains are currently constrained. If you look at the biggest issue right now is about container availability and having ships to actually move those containers around and get it back to either suppliers or customers to fill those, to, for them to get their product. And you have heard just roughly about three to four weeks ago, the Suez Canal was completely restricted for around seven to eight days, which also affected the supply chain routes coming from Europe. Um, so unfortunately, the impacts of COVID on the imported business, not just from China, but I think from around the world, is still currently constrained. We would only see that easing up in the next six to 12 months if we're lucky, as because most countries have either gone into a second wave or a third wave, whereby their supplier and their supply chains have also now been impacted by these secondary lockdowns. So that has caused a whole backlog in the supply chain from production to, through to the end user. So it's not just specifically a China type of issue, we, we import product from various geographies. So whether it's from the North, East or the West, we are seeing supply chain lead times that have been between four to six weeks increase initially post COVID to about eight to 12 weeks. They're now hovering between the eight to 10 week period if there's no delays at present. Right, thank you so much. Megan, um, if I can, if I, if I can add in there, I think just the five cents that I can add. You know, I think uh, talking to sort of the travel restrictions, I think, um, and Rob's Rob's already touched on it a little bit. You know, we've certainly been impacted in in a way where, from a technical support perspective, from Europe, uh, you know, when it comes to uh, equipment installations, um, moving it, moving equipment in, and. and uh, yeah, I suppose launching new equipment, that's, I mean, that's been massively challenging for us. Um, as you know, the guys are locked down in Europe uh, a lot more than what we've been. And uh, to get those technicians to travel has been, and still remains challenging for us. We're expecting, I think they need to, inevitably in the UK, I think we're looking at uh, two jabs, two vaccination jabs that they have to have before they uh, sort of open. Now, I think around 21st of June, if I'm not mistaken, is sort of the targeted date for the UK for people to start traveling again. So we anticipate from that stage that we'll start seeing a little bit more flow and obviously from an equipment and an installation perspective and easing up the, the, the installation challenges that we've had that will, that will obviously uh, start running a lot smoother from that stage. But yeah, definitely, I think it goes away from the sort of China supply chain, but certainly from a technical perspective, uh, future films definitely had our challenges in that space. Thanks so much, Franz. Um, so I just want to remind our audience, please, you're welcome to post your questions in the question and answer section. Please also take our polls, you know, anything you want to know from suppliers, um, you're welcome to ask. 
Um, so Bob, I'm going to go to you now. Uh, what is your advice for print and signage business owners to seize business opportunities during these tough times? I don't think, I don't think it's changed. You know, really, for every customer out there, it's really to see what value they need to add to, 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 to the other person's life. So what we've seen, the customers that have survived and grown are the ones that have broadened their their product offerings um, and also been innovative with new products. I think I don't see COVID as, as a really, a, well, the whole debacle around COVID as a negative. It's, it's, it's allowed everybody to focus on what's important, get rid of the rubbish and really focus on what's critical to their business. So uh, if you want to survive, you need to adapt to the market and adapt to what your customers require. Uh, most of our customers are doing very well, but they've diversified. They've diversified their product, and they focus on 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 value on the value addition to the customer. So I think I, I would say that most of our customers are more profitable than they were a year ago, because they're not the guys who were doing all the cheap stuff at silly rates in the market haven't survived. They're gone. So I think our the customers who have really been focusing on quality have survived. Those who've been focusing on price, well, then unfortunately their margins were so small they didn't have any savings. So uh, it's critical that the lesson from COVID is build up rainy day funds, make sure that you can survive, reduce your debt. Um, and I think the customers that have survived have done just that. Um, so then, Devandran, I'm going to go back to you. What are the key industry trends for 2021? Oh, um, a tough one. I think um, if you look at, um, like Bob says, I think COVID has brought upon new opportunities. So the signage industry has been predominantly focused on the current way of doing things. And I think COVID is going to start step changing that in terms, especially in the signage market of, how would we like to present and offer our various end users different platforms? Because if you look at with the COVID and the pandemic, certain raw material input costs into standard substrates have almost increased by 30 to 40 percent during this period. Obviously, that then is a cost that needs to be passed on to the end retailer or consumer, whether you're in brand advertising or in printing a normal restaurant brochure. Those are all costs that these industries cannot sustain any longer. So what is going to be the step change and development and technologies into higher, more cost-effective solutions to change the landscape of the printing industry? And I think that's what's going to drive where the trends and what the science industry is going to do post all of this is in a market like the African continent, we are always under cost containment and cost pressures like everyone experiences. So the ability to sell perceived value is coming under huge strain post the COVID pandemic. How do we sustain and weather that storm? It's always about looking at the opportunity of how do we shift change the market? So I look at four things that I ask myself. What is it that we need to start doing? What is it that we need to stop? What is it that we need to suspend during this time? And what is it that you want to sustain during this period to create the new trends and to lead the market to shift and to create that mindset for change post the pandemic of what is now value adding to you whilst we understand the pressures of a depressed economic climate. Great, thank you so much. Um, so Rob, I'm gonna go back to you. Um, are there still concerns over the international supply chain? Yeah, I'm just gonna unmute you. Just unmute yourself. Yeah. Now, if the question is around international supply chain, yes, we are very much affected by that, as Grant was saying. In terms of China on its own, we don't also import very much from China. And since the initial hard lockdown, we haven't seen any specific um, downturn in the ability to supply. But in general, um, particularly um, spare parts, as Grant was saying, machines, availability, shipping, you know, we used to rely on spare part availability with, if we didn't have it in our own inventory within three to four business days. You know, the guy would be knocking on our door delivering the part three or four days now, if you're lucky, is 10 to 12 days. Um, and that's with courier. That's with reputable courier companies, not necessarily relying on passenger aircraft. So I think the, the, the fight that's going on for, for um, 
for space on, on, on airlines and the few cargo airlines that are flying and also the courier companies and what few passenger airlines are flying, it's only obvious that the supply chain is going to get impacted. So all we've had to do is make sure that we increase our, our, our inventories to allow for those longer lead times. So it is, I would say, probably the biggest challenge for us in the next six months is maintaining that consistent flow of, of goods, spare parts, inks, machines, etc., into South Africa. And it's a daily challenge. It's it's not going to go away in a hurry until the airline open all the airlines open up again um, flying to South Africa. Great. Thanks so much. Um, then Grant, what is your advice for print and signage business owners to seize business opportunities? Good. Megan, I think, um, you know, I think we, we've all touched on a lot of it already and COVID's obviously had a massive impact. So I think the big thing, the advice that I'd give right now is uh, really, I think we need to look at cost containment. The vendor has spoken to that already. I think uh, we need to start looking at uh, creating leaner organizations. I think that's what uh, COVID certainly taught us is um, the way we've historically done business um, and thrown people at problems, you know, is maybe something that we need to rethink. So, you know, we've seen a lot of our customers, I've actually been bewildered at how well our customers have come through this pandemic. It's absolutely incredible how they've come through this, this pandemic. I can only take my hat off to them. Um, we understand the cash flow challenges that have been out there. Um, and the success that we've seen with a lot of our customers has come from historic uh, investment in their business, I think. I think there's been a lot of investment in technology in terms of software, uh, MIS systems, um, which I think all of us that are on this panel uh, certainly have our, have our offering in that regard. Um, but I think it's that, that, that pre-investment that has allowed customers to get through this investment in technology. And I think if you look at studies, uh, you know, outside of our industry, it just shows businesses that invested in technology prior to the pandemic are the ones that have flourished. And I suppose we only have to speak to our, the, the, the big businesses out there. We have to talk to Tesla, we have to talk to Amazon, and we look at what the, you know, what, the, what sort of, uh, uh, their, their, their growth has been over this uh, and through this pandemic. So it's been quite incredible. So my advice would be um, to the industry is continue to invest in your business. I, I know it's tough and I know it's challenging, but I suppose challenge us as the people sitting on this forum to, to look at ways to assist them uh, through those struggles in terms of cash flow. Rob's already alluded to it. Uh, you know, I think uh, OPEX taking things off balance sheet, looking at uh, you know, different ways to, to, to bring equipment into your business, softwares, et cetera. And I think we're all open, open-minded and we understand the challenges out there. So, so look at that. And uh, Bob, Bob alluded to it as well, I think. The, the, the core of everything that that you have to do now has to be centered around your customer and customer service, uh, helping them to help their customers, I suppose, working with them to add value um, and, you know, taking what you've got backward, integrating, diversifying and look at new opportunities um, that your customers can invest in. And uh, I suppose it's our job to, to try and assist in that regard. But certainly look at ways to backward integrate. And those are who, are, who don't have that risk appetite, I suppose, is really knuckle down and focus, focus on your core business. Um, I suppose as the, the cliche goes, you know, stick to your knitting and really, really get focused on that and find ways to, to add value and, and, and you know, uh, uh, I suppose expand on what your core your core business is. So that would be my advice. And spend a lot more time with your customers. You know, may, if, if not online, try spend time face to face. We always see the value in that. I mean, the more time we see our sales teams and our product managers out there in the market, you know, we see the value in that. So I can only say that's where our core focus is at the moment: is really understanding our customers, sitting down, listening to them, and understanding their strategies, understanding what, what it is they want to do with their business, understanding what the, the next step in their journey is, and then just seeing how we can align with that um, and then assist them in, in you know, achieving those, uh, those strategies. So, yeah, hope that helps a bit. Yeah. Uh, so, Bob, I'm just going to go back to you. Um, which industry sectors have experienced an increase in demand over the last year have you found? Uh, so the amazing was probably the biggest growth area due to masks and all sorts of other things. Um, we, other than that, I haven't really seen any big major, major trend change. Um, what surprised me is in actual fact, everybody got back to work in May. 
Uh, so April was a funny month, but everybody actually got back to work and focused on improving their businesses. And uh, we haven't, we don't see a downturn post May. We actually see that everybody's just well, extremely focused, solved the problems, but the only spurious one is sublimation due to the mask issues. Um, but other than that, we haven't seen really major changes in the industry. Okay, so in other, so I was going to ask you, I mean, the key industry, so just while I've got you here, what are the key industry trends for 2021? Wow. <laughs> key industry trends? Uh, I think I've already alluded to it, focus. Get out of, get out of stuff that's wasting your time. Um, cost reductions, uh, customer focus. Uh, I think just get rid of the rubbish. I think that's the key industry trend. As far as the technology and the R&D, well, everybody's changing. Everybody, I mean, manufacturers are all changing their focus, obviously trying to find trying to find solutions, but I don't see any major upheavals this year. I think maybe next year you'll see some new, extremely innovative uh, technologies coming along. But I don't see in this coming 2021 any major changes into what we're doing um, from a from a user perspective or the for the for the for the sign manufacturer. Um, it's a consolidation year, really. I can't see any major changes. Okay, and then um, Bob, while I've got you, we've got a question from um, Ketsi. She says regarding ink, especially Roland TR2, she's noticed an issue with supply chain. Any chance of seeing an end to this soon? <laughs> it, has, it has ended as of, as of two days ago. So that was an issue. One of the big problems you had is people who were forecasting in Europe and forecasting in the United States forecasted a major downturn. In actual fact, they were, we folk forecast the growth and the manufacturer obviously manufactured too few, so Japan manufactured too little product for the growth and it's taken some time to catch up. But as of yesterday, I think yesterday or the day before, the TR2 issue has been solved. Right, now I'm gonna go back to um, Devendra. What is your advice for print and signage business owners to seize business opportunities? Um, I think I alluded to, to it before. Um, COVID has brought upon different opportunities. People that never dabbled in fabrication or thermal forming or other avenues of acrylic sheets or developing, thinking out the box solutions of what can the existing or preordained um, signage material be used for other avenues for exploration. And COVID shift or mindset change a lot of the smaller businesses to focus on the products that they did buy from signage manufacturers to make standalone products could be utilized in other avenues. So for me, I think um, the best advice for all of them is to guys focus on what you've got. Look at the opportunities at the market and where the market's shifting towards. Leverage those. So I come back to the four things. Start refocusing your business and your initiatives, cost containment, stop all the wasteful expenditure, suspend things that are not adding value to your business during this period, and sustain what you're good at. Stay true to your core values. Pre-COVID, what made your business strong and independent? COVID showed you some underlying flaws, fix those, clean, clean the back end, and then focus on what is it that our customers want? Where's the business moving to, how do we adapt, change, be flexible to meet and service that customer need as best as possible. Great. Okay, so Rob, I'm going to come back to you. What is your advice for print and signage business owners to seize business opportunities during this time? Um, at, the, at the risk of being a little bit controversial, I've heard uh, stick to your knitting and stick to your core focus, and yet I'm a big believer in think outside the box. And they're kind of contradictory in a way. So I, I agree with that. But if you can knit a jersey, guess what? You can also knit a scarf and you can knit a hoodie and you can knit all sorts of things. So the fact is, people sit with a lot of technology and they haven't fully explored what that technology can be put to use for. It's still within sticking to their knitting. It's still the core of what they do. Um, but there are industries that can be served by that technology that people didn't think of. Who thought 
you know, anybody with a digital cutter pre-February 2020, who thought of using their cutter not to make a sign, but to make PPE face shields? And yet we've got customers in April and May said they had their best months ever. And I think Devandran, in terms of the sales of, of uh, polyethylene and all of those sheets and materials, it was a wonderful time. We had customers doing an awful lot of work, very, very successful. Now that PPE work has dropped off because all the tenderpreneurs have brought in their containers from China and, and it's killed the local industry in terms of manufacturing that. So as I said, I'm a huge believer in think outside the box. You know, just the medical industry is, is, is ripe for, for, for signage even, hospitals. You know, we've done programs, I'm going back two or three years, where we wallpapered the entire burns unit at Baraguana Hospital. And, and why? I mean, it's just to try and put some pleasure, if you can derive any pleasure from being in a birds unit, but just to try and soften the blow for young kids and those sort of things. So yes, somebody has to get out there and convince these institutions. And of course, the minute you, you start wanting to put signage into hospitals and creches, et cetera, you know, for, for, for their betterment and general feel, you've then also got to look at the sustainability of the environment. So that becomes a question. I see Lynn Smith has posted a question on that as well. Yes, there is a trend towards sustainability. So think, um, outside, some, think outside the box. I can just add to that. Um, you know, we, we predominantly, or predominantly spend time in the vehicle wrapping market. People worried about protecting their vehicles from chips and paint and stone damages and so forth by putting and applying a body fence product. Suppliers during this period saw the opportunity and developed protection foams that you could actually apply onto surfaces that could eradicate bacteria. So somebody working in a hospital environment or working in a fast food chain could now apply a protective foam on, them, on their products to actually kill surface bacteria almost 99.9%, as well as certain strains of the initial COVID virus as well. So people have seen the opportunity, taken existing things, thought out the box, we make vehicle car wraps or protection firms. How can we use this product now, add a little more R&D into it to develop a new scientific material that can be applied into any general use area now? Thank you. Um, so I'm going to go to Grant now. Um, Grant, just in terms, can you touch on the, how COVID-19 has affected the market and how have your customers adapted? Um, greatly, I think, uh, initially. Um, but again, and Rob's just said the same, we, we had some customers had an incredible time during COVID. So it's, uh, you know, it's a bit, of a bit of a tough one to answer because the reality is some were, some were really, really hamstrung by by, by COVID, um, we saw that. I think the, all businesses were affected by COVID. I think we're talking outside of industry, everyone was affected, including Fujifilm. You know, we did restructuring, some reshuffling and that type of thing. And I think many businesses would have done that. And I'm sure many of our customers, well, we know that many of our customers did do that. Um, again, part of just becoming leaner, um, you know, being more efficient through that time, um, managing costs to, you know, survive, I suppose. Um, so COVID definitely had an impact. Um, and yeah, I suppose, I suppose keys, uh, I suppose, you know, people had to try to find ways to, to free up cash flow and that type of thing. So, so, so you're right. I mean, I'd, Rob, you're right. I spoke to you, stick to your knitting, but you're quite right. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's such a contentious one because you're right. There, 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 there's so many different parallels in this printing industry. I mean, and uh, there's there's very few of our customers that sit in one space that just sit in commercial, um, or they just sit in wide format, or they just sit. In. So there's there's opportunities out there. There's no doubt. And I guess the challenge lies not only with our customers but with us as suppliers to find ways to help reignite, uh, reinvent uh, the, this industry and 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 help our customers to think outside of the box. So I think sometimes you can get so caught up in your business on a day-to-day -day basis. And I suppose we need to almost act as those non-executive directors of their businesses to add advice and to just see things from a, you know, so almost from a, from a helicopter view, I guess, if you're, if we want to refer to it as that. So I guess, um, you know, everyone's been greatly affected. And again, I say I'm, I'm bewildered at how well our database, and I speak to our customer base, how well we've come through that. We've been had very, very little impact from a bad debt perspective. You know, people have honored, honored their, their, their outstanding uh, sort of debts to us. So it's been really, really incredible. You know, I think we initially anticipated that we would, we would see a lot of bad debts and that type of thing. But this industry is... I mean, I suppose as South, South Africans, I suppose we, we just, uh, we're such a, 
a strong strong world nation um uh, we we're uh, we've learned to be industrious we've learned to be um creative and innovative you know we've had to and we were a survivalist nation i mean that's that's what we're about as south africans so and again i think we've seen it in our industry it's been incredible how we've gotten through COVID. so there's been impacts but i think i'd like to say that we're seeing the back end of of that impact now uh, certainly seeing a, a move in the right direction from many of our customers we're starting to see the the the, the industry switch on again uh, which is exciting for us you know there's a lot of inquiries in the market in terms of equipment which is exciting the people are looking to reinvest you there's a lot of uh, um, interest in in mis um, softwares you know workflow softwares for businesses which is encouraging for me because i've always been an advocate a great advocate and a believer in workflow to 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 run your business um so yeah i think um uh, hopefully that answers the question but the impact's real um, but people have gotten through it very very well yeah thank you so much so Bob, I'm gonna go back to you. I think you have touched on it, but just the, can you just give a comment over the, um, on the international um, supply chain? Cause there does seem to be quite a lot of frustration um, over this from customers. Um, besides giving a comment on the, on the supply chain, can you also maybe comment on, I don't know, do suppliers need to be just more transparent um, and communicate more with customers to kind of and prevent that frustration or minimize that frustration from, from you know, your clients? Well, the, the supply chain constraints are real. And, and obviously all of the timing models that we use in the past for getting inventory to the correct levels all fell apart, but they fell apart everywhere. So, but it's taken time. I don't, it's taking time to read to create new models. Remember, our stock takes three months from the time we order to the time it gets here, three months. So it takes effectively a long time to turn the boat. But from our perspective, and I can't talk to the rest of the industry, our systems have now adjusted to the new time flows. So we're in a position now where our stock holding is a lot higher than it was before because we're dealing with effectively between a 30 and a 45 day delay extra on all of our shipments. So we're talking instead of a three months planning window, we're now talking about a four month planning window, but that takes time for the boat to turn. Um, so I would say that the supply constraints are going to fall off because I think most suppliers would be like us. We've now retrained our models to deal with all of these delays that, that weren't in the models before. Um, but the second part of your question, sorry, Megan. Um, maybe just because there does seem to be a lot of frustration around, um, also in our polls, which I'll touch on, is um, maybe lack of communication or um, do you think there needs to be more transparency from suppliers on exactly what is going on um, and you're keeping the communication flow open to kind of minimize that frustration? Because what a lot of these people or well, some people in our polls have been saying is there's just been a lack of communication. And I think, do you think it would make the situation better if, suppliers just also get communication from uh, maybe the international um, company, like for example, Roland International or any international company to have notices for coming down from there so people can think that it's not just the local suppliers who are not doing their job, you know? I think we all got to take the blame. I mean, we all, we all got caught and we all have to then, we have to then adjust. I don't think we can fob it off to the, to, to the rest of the world. We all we all got caught. So we all had to adjust and we've now adjusted and the new model. As far as transparency is concerned, yes, very definitely. Uh, I, I'm, I'm known for being transparent to the point that I'm rude. So I don't have a problem with transparency, but we would need to analyze because obviously we service the market through a set of dealers. We are transparent to the dealers and I would need to talk to the dealers to see if they have informed the customers because we obviously tell the dealers about what our situation is and how we're dealing with the issues. If they haven't communicated, that's bad. And we are having a dealer meeting soon and I will deal with the dealers. Yeah, great. Um, so Devandran, I'm gonna go back to you. How has COVID-19 um, affected the market in your perspective and how have your customers um, adapted? I think you did touch on the, the sort of innovation. Um, anything else you can add to that? Um, yeah, I think the general consensus is that 
no, no industry was left immune from the aftermath of COVID. Everyone felt some shape or format, barring maybe the pharmaceutical and the telecommunication industry, which had a huge growth in the spike because everyone wanted to work remotely and so forth. And then obviously the pharmaceutical industry to service the need because of the impact of around COVID. But I think every other industry has taken in some shape or format, some type of pain through this. You know, so in terms of how to affect the signage industry in South Africa, I think a lot of small businesses came under huge cost and cash flow pressures during the period. And being one of the partners in the industry, we've had to find ways of how do we help to trade with certain key customers and partners, how to find better solutions, better models to do things. So just touching on the supply chain, you know, in terms of can we communicate the message to customers more effectively? Yes. We all learned through this process that there was a lot of things that were based on best practice at the time that we set up, like ordering and supply chains being just in time. Customers got used to that, and that was how the system and companies built themselves. When COVID hit, it then created, like I said, it's not merely a supplier or manufacturer problem, it's also a shipping line and industry issue where you're not able to turn around vessels through a pandemic with port closures that now added a further dynamic to supply chains that companies could not really forecast or bring into their business model at the time. So in terms of the market being affected, I think there was a whole lot of new challenges that were brought to the surface and businesses now need to adapt and plan for those changes to ensure we can service our customers more effectively going forward. So I think from an impact to the South African market, it's purely been customers who have gotten so used to having everything in a just-in-time system over the last five, 10 years as systems and technology and things moved and improved around the world. And when COVID hit, a lot of them believed that us as big organizations should have cushioned this impact or planned for it better. Therefore, them as a small business should not have seen this drastic supply chain related issues. And I think that's where the biggest learning aspect has come around is that no industry is immune to such pandemics. No matter how much of planning you can do in scenario analysis, there are certain things that you cannot plan for effectively. And unfortunately, it has to be a little bit of reactive, but things have settled now. The market has calmed down. We have put better policies, processes, systems in place to help manage that dynamic. Great, thank you so much. Um, so Brian, just for time, I'm gonna um, skip to you. Just which industry sectors have experienced an increase in demand over the last year? I think this also ties in with Lance's question in which industry do you see an increase in sales? So maybe just which industry have you seen an increase in demand and um, sales over this, um, over the past year? Is that aimed at me, uh, Megan? Sorry, was okay. Perfect. Um, so I suppose uh, as Fujifilm, we focus on a couple of uh, core, core sectors in the industry, uh, obviously offset commercial uh, being one. And I think globally, um, the trend there, as everyone would know, I mean, there's been a downward trend in the, in the litho industry, I guess, here for many, many years. If we look at European numbers, we're seeing a decline in that space of around 15 to 20% per annum, which is quite significant. Um, but then in that same breath, we're seeing the uptake on our commercial digital front and on the commercial digital front in terms of inkjet, uh, commercial inkjet printers, etc. certainly starting to replace that. And I think that's just in line with uh, what the world's doing from a print perspective. You know, we're not seeing the tremendous long run that we used to do his, uh, see historically in the past with hundreds of thousands of copies of things being done. So the demand in the print industry is around, you know, 5,000, 10,000, you know, sort of runs at a time. So, you know, the cost on running that commercially on, a, on, on an offset press versus running that in a digital environment is so much, so much, uh, you know, more effective to run it in a digital space, as we know. So we, we certainly see the, the decline on the offset commercial side. But we're also seeing, you know, sort of the reverse from a commercial perspective. We've seen the digital commercial side uh, increase. Um, 
another space where we've seen great growth um, and, and the trend is definitely an upward space is certainly in the flexible space, uh, the packaging labels industry. I mean, there's no doubt for us that's a very, very exciting environment. So for those I think already playing in that space, that's going to be uh, an exciting space to be in. I think that again lines up with worldwide trends, um, the flexible, flexible market, uh, mo flexible industries, definitely an area um, where we are focused as a business. And then um, for us, the wide format business, uh, we, we, we come here of quite a small base. Um, so I mean, we, we're a newish player in the market, uh, Fujifilm from a wide format perspective, certainly in South Africa. And, um, you know, I suppose we've been feeling that market, but we've seen some nice growth. But again, I say it comes off a very, very low base for, for Fujifilm, but we're seeing a nice trend in that space. Um, uh, most of that uh, would probably be in the flatbed space, uh, flatbed printing. So I think this is this is a sign of customers diversifying their business a little bit, moving away from roll to roll, application of vinyls onto, onto boards and substrates, um, direct printing, um, uh, playing with different substrates that they can now, now offer to their customers, you know, to, to be more innovative and creative for their clients. Um, and that complemented by, you know, our, uh, the, the sort of cutting range of equipment um, we've spoken to. I mean, those complement each other nicely. So um, I'd say those are the areas, and that's certainly by the, the areas that I can speak to, um, you know, from a Fujifilm perspective, those are our four uh, core sec uh, key sectors that we focus in. So, uh, yeah, that's where, um, where I can speak to, I guess. So, Megan. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to share some of the results from um, the poll that we've taken or that we put out. Uh, I just want to get my screen up here. Uh, just open your slides. So in the meantime, if I'll, um, as I said, just please take our polls in the, in the poll section uh, while I just try and get these slides open here. Uh, let's see. Okay, while I'm just trying to deal with that, I think I'll just go into the, the last uh, question while opening that. Um, Rob, just in terms of, um, can you also touch on what industry sectors have you experienced an increase in demand over the last year? Someone's asking about dye sublimation. They said, surely... And um, dye sublimation has definitely seen an increase. Yeah, I'm, I'm, unlike Grant to a Fuji with a sort of fairly wide range of sectors they deal with our businesses, outdoor and indoor, indoor advertising. That can be soft sound, it can be on textile, and even if it's on textile, it can be dye sublimation or direct to textile with pigmented ink or even latex ink. So we haven't seen any specific sector during a hard lockdown. Certainly anybody who owned a digital cutter was doing fairly well out of PPE. And there was a lot of mask printing going on as Bob uh, alluded to as well. So a lot of the dye sub uh, business increased. We're a newcomer to the dye sub game with, with the HP products as in the last year. So we don't see it as yet as a major part of our, um, you know, of our offering, but in traditional signage and, and cutting automation, um, as I said, PPE drove a fair amount of growth last year. Um, the irony is we had a better financial year during COVID than we had the year before. So elections are worse for us, it seems, as a business as, uh, than, than, than a pandemic, because that was election year in 2019, and that threw the market into complete disarray. I see Bob enjoyed that, uh, that comment. So on no specific sector, we've seen everybody getting back to levels that are reasonably close to pre pre COVID. And obviously with um, particularly liquor advertising, uh, pretty much on the move again, because that ground to halt a lot of our customers rely heavily on that. Um, we're seeing numbers, particularly in terms of ink sales, which is our measure of, of the activity in the market, we see people getting back pretty much to where they were before COVID. A couple of casualties along the way, people who did uh, think out the box and extend their, their knitting abilities. Um, did do well during COVID and they've built a sustainable business that would survive the next pandemic. So um, if that answers your question. Great, thanks Ron. Let's see if I can uh, share these slides. Okay, so this is just uh, the results from the polls that we sent out to our readers and most of them from the signage industry graphics, uh, branding, uh, t-shirt printing and garment printing. So that's kind of the overview of the people who, uh, who took our, our polls.
vehicle branding as well, and um, laser cutting and engraving. And then, um, so what we asked is, uh, what are the most important things you desire from suppliers in 2021? As you can see, consistent across the board, it was stock availability, consistent supply and delivery. I think people were just um, a little bit frustrated with that. And some of the top comments, what I want to touch on is, um, so one of the comments was help small firms access machinery on rent to own options as capital is the number one problem at the moment. So Rob, you touched on this. I wonder if um, maybe Grant from Fujifilm or um, Bob from Roller Next could just touch on the, what do you think that suppliers um, need to do to, to help with the equipment finance in terms of having flexible payment options, rent to own, that kind of thing. Um, maybe Grant, I'll start with you. Am I on? There we go. Sorry. Um, Megan, I think chat to us, I suppose, would be probably, I mean, I think uh, I'll probably speak on everyone's behalf. We open-minded. There's obviously some limitations. There's the standard credit, credit vetting processes that people need to go through. Um, I think like all businesses, as the as the uh, the businesses that we're speaking to here, I mean, they would understand the, the you know, the risk mitigation factors. So, but we're certainly open to it. Uh, we certainly, uh, you know, would, would look at finding different ways to support businesses. Rob's alluded to, you know, different similar similar sort of uh, uh, off-balance sheet opportunities where you pay per click, pay per, pay per running meter, whatever it might be. So there's multiple solutions out in the industry. I think uh, what I'd encourage people on this call to do, um, and I'll hand this over to, to Rob and Bob, and they can, uh, sorry, <laughs> Rob and Bob, and uh, they, they can they can probably add their piece. But I mean, they, um, the, I would just challenge everyone to reach out to us. Uh, challenge us and see what we can come up with. You know, we've got a uh, Fiji Pharma speak on our behalf again, and we've got a financial solution in uh, or financial house that we work with. So um, it's a Fiji Farm financial services. So we can certainly offer in certain spaces, we can offer different, different sort of off balance sheet uh, op options. So yeah, reach out to us. Rob, I'm not sure you can add something to that, I guess. Yeah, Rob? Yeah, yeah and it, it you know, our customers clearly have lots of frustrations, as we can see in that poll and stock availability and consistent supply being the first. That's no surprise to me whatsoever, you know, given what we've gone through. And then we look at us as a supplier and what are our biggest frustrations and our biggest frustrations are the banks. You know, they pay lip service to, to you know, opening up the market and, and, and lending, but they're doing nothing to help companies grow their businesses during this environment. I see one of the questions that was posted is what can government be government be doing and I like Bob's response saying just leave it to the people we're innovative and we're very clever and I agree with that however tell the banks to loosen up on 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 the on the lending criteria you know the bottom line is most of the companies who want to invest are doing it because they're going to increase their affordability increase their profitability banks don't see that anymore they look at a photo a snapshot picture of a company's affordability and and it's either a yes or a no and I think that is actually quite shocking so I think the banking industry has a lot to answer for. In Grant's case, he has uh, his own financial you know, capability within the business. We often extend a certain amount of terms to customers to help them. And then we deal with rental companies to offer off balance sheet. We are certainly moving towards the ability to offer a contractual relationship with a customer where we can charge a cost per copy that covers machine and, um, and supplies and, and service. Uh, the problem is customers would still have to be vetted, but our uh, risk aversion is way less than a bank's risk aversion because we know customers are inevitably going to make money. They're buying equipment on the back of a contract, for example. It's a given, and yet the banks don't see through that. They purely look at a, uh, an affordability picture. So that's the real pity. And unfortunately, with the rental companies, some of them will rent off their own book, but most of them are going back to the traditional lenders, uh, banks, and if they get a no from them, they have to forward a note to the customer. So I think for all of the suppliers, the desire is there to help customers be able to finance and put equipment in place. But at the end of the day, it's the banks who inevitably put up the money. And if they don't change their lending criteria, which I think bank uh, government can influence, then it's tough. And, and unless you're a blue chip company and you've got a really strong set of financials, it is really, really hard to get into you know, acquisition. Uh, Bob, if you want to add to that. You're on mute. Oh, uh, Bob? Yeah, just unmute yourself. Uh, 
I can't really add anything other than be careful with the, the, the users must be very careful to look at the the documents. There are one of, one of the biggest issues with the with the rental market is that the book gets sold. And it gets conveniently sold at particular times when the mass of users um, have got to a point where the, the equipment is supposed to be returned, which is not a, a legal, it's not legally available. In other words, the rental company will say rent to own and will buy, it will give you some, an under the table agreement that once you paid off the 60th installment, you'll get your machine for $1. Um, at when when a lot of rental companies, what they've been doing is get the volume up to the point where it gets to that critical stage where this equipment is supposed to be returned, they sell the book to a new company and these contracts are then uh, null and void, obviously, because the new owner doesn't have to, because it's not a legal requirement. So just be careful with who you deal with. Uh, we don't do rentals, but our dealers, some of our dealers do. Um, I, I need you to read those documents very carefully and understand the risk. I had to take a particular company on a class action suite about five years ago, a rental company who took a lot of Roman customers, tried to steal the equipment from Roman customers. So be careful, be aware. Not everyone in the capital business is, is playing it with a straight set of cards. So, um, Devendran, I also wanted to do because you're also on the, um, you know, the consumable side and one of the points here and probably I think in our next um, slide is having consistent price lists and people experiencing what they think or what they perceive as prices changing on a daily basis. Um, have Do you think on a supply side, have you guys kind of um, struggled to kind of keep up with um consistent prices because of the, the fluctuations and that kind of thing? So uh, this is always a tough one to, to answer, uh, but I'm gonna give it, give it a shot to try and explain some of the challenges. So like every business has never not been immune to the COVID impact. So all businesses post the COVID are always trying to find avenues to get back to a sound footing. So let's look at the South African market. You've got a company as big as Silla Mittal during the COVID period or post the COVID initial onset from June through to the end of December, had to pass through roughly three price increases over a period of three months that took the pricing from about, let's call it being one rand to being almost five rand for the same item on the basis that they needed to recover and to get an economies of scale to load their facility to run a furnace to produce a certain product item. So there's a certain on cost that if you don't have the right amount of input to produce the finished item now it costs you a lot more because there's no longer the economies of scale. The other part of the pricing dynamic and it changing and fluctuating is there's added on cost and pricing fluctuation outside of the supplier's mandate in the sense that raw material prices, especially in the consumable side of, of our business, like if you look at MMA monomer utilized in most acrylic sheeting has been increasing over 50% per quarter for the last three quarters because international demand for the product has increased. But because of the COVID lockdown, manufacturing facilities like Mitsubishi in Japan have got a reduced throughput through their facility. Therefore, they cannot produce as much MMA or chemical compounds to make the MMA modifier. Therefore, the raw material prices is now increasing. That raw material price then gets passed on to us as a supplier, which we can only subsidize a certain portion, and that then gets passed on to the consumer. To the raw material price fluctuations, you then have shipping line charges. Shipping costs have increased roughly 10, 15, 20% post the COVID impact. So to try and give customers the ideal situation pre-COVID where you'd have a price list, you're happy to hold it for a quarter, sometimes on certain key products for full 12 months. Unfortunately, in, in these current tough economic climate that we find ourselves in, it's very hard to hold prices static for a, a sustained period of time like we used to do in the past because the external factors that are facing manufacturers, small business, shipping lines is changing on a daily basis. So some products, as they land, they are recosted on the latest pricing, and therefore you'll have this shift change. 
because the supply chains are so constrained and having certain shortages, you will see a slight, a slight increase or a change in pricing from order to order, unfortunately, because of the current market dynamic that we find ourselves in with the external factors changing so rapidly, we as business cannot contain or absorb all of that in one go purely because of the impact of COVID and the cash flow scenarios that it's had on most businesses over the last 12 months. Great. And then Devandran, I've got a question here. And one of the comments from this slide that's up is um, that innovation has slowed down, but you kind of took a different view earlier when you said, you know, how customers have innovated. So do you, do you, do you agree with that statement that innovation has slowed in some ways and um, maybe increased in other ways during COVID-19? Like I said, I thought COVID-19 was actually an opportunity because people now innovated with products that were meant for a certain segment, like the wool that Rob said, you were knitting jerseys with them. The same wool could be used to knit a scarf or a blanket. How did they utilize that? So I don't think innovation, maybe from a broad perspective, you are not seeing as much innovation because the market and the world is closed, but individual customers have created their own small little innovative bays or hubs that they've been taking certain products and utilizing for a very different use in terms of helping them to manage costs effectively, come up with unique applications to provide the end user with better solutions. So the tried and tested formulations of how you used to make signage will be shifting. I don't think innovation in the, in the sector has stopped. We certainly as a company have not slowed down on our, our innovation drive. Over the next six to 12 weeks, you'll see a huge shift in the technology and digital transformation we as a company have embarked on uh, as well to make it the ease of doing business with us to be a lot more at your fingertips, in your home, 24 seven, you'll be able to interact with us and have live critical information to help you make better business decisions. So I don't really agree that innovation is dead or slowing during this time. I just think the innovation has changed to a different shape or format that is gonna challenge all of us to rethink the way the science industry is currently set up. So that was um, that slide. And in terms of what uh, what would you like to see more of this year? These are our respondents, and they said rep visits, uh, product training came out tops, uh, seminars, and exhibitions of all the latest um, products. So that was also um, in terms of product training. That was also a question I see it, um, it, it both in the survey and in the polls. Um, do you think the suppliers, um, maybe uh, Rob, let me just um, aim this at you. Do you think suppliers offer enough in terms of training and supporting people like startup businesses and people wanting to get into um, the industry? I, I can't speak for everybody, but um, that comes as a little bit of a surprise to me. We, we take tremendous efforts in making sure customers are suitably trained. We we encourage um, customers while they're waiting for machine deliveries to come and spend time in our innovation hub and actually operate the equipment so by the time their machines arrive, they're pretty much au fait. And the same is true in the media game. You know, the, the, we tend to specialize on more um, sort of vertical market medias. I saw one of the questions around nobody's bringing in translucent vinyl for window films, and yet I think 30% of our revenues in media is actually in translucent films for, for window applications. So I think people perhaps just need to look a little bit wider. Uh, that training is available. We are more than happy to give it. And I'm sure Grant, Bob, you know, in terms of equipment supplies, are more than happy to give uh, as much training as is needed, needed to make the company or the customer proficient. No point having a machine out there and the customer doesn't know how to use it properly. That just doesn't make any sense. I think we all put in a lot of effort. I'm just sorry to see that some people feel that we're falling short. So we need some concrete suggestions, but we're open to, to that. And we do run a lot of training in our, in our innovation hub for, for existing players and, and new players. And of course, Megan, you haven't mentioned the exhibition next week, but um, you know, we're, yeah. we're dipping our toes back into, that, uh, into those waters again with, uh, with the exhibition in Johannesburg next week. And, and, and I hope it's successful. I hope people will, will support it. You know, it's been a dilemma in terms of deciding, do we, don't we? You know, it's a, it's a, it's a real catch 22. 
but we've bitten the bullet. And, and as I said, I hope uh, you know, the, the audience today supports that trade show and, and comes and looks at the new equipment as they as they so wanting to do. Yes, so our expo next week, our Sign Africa Expo will be taking place from the 21st to the 23rd of April at Emperor's Convention Center. All COVID-19 um, restrictions will be in place or rules will be followed. And it's just a chance to energize the industry and to show the cutting edge um, equipment and for people to speak to experts in the industry. So we hope to see most of the people on this call there. Um, and our final um, uh, question, this is uh, besides pricing, what can industry suppliers do to help businesses in 2021? Um, assistance in marketing, research and tools, training and industry education, which we have touched on inform um, businesses of new products and latest offerings, offer credit um, rent to own flexible payment plans, um, offer alternative products and unavailable stock, faster delivery, networking opportunities, better backup service, um, and we have touched on the, on the other ones. Now, in terms of the, the networking opportunities and assistance in marketing and research tools, that is quite a big thing in that people don't feel like um, or maybe should I, should I maybe pose the question and say, um, Bob, do you think the suppliers have almost a responsibility or can facilitate more networking opportunities for um, customers and more innovation days? Um, like I've been to, I've been to um, one or two innovation days at certain companies where they have consultants come in, brand consultants, and they teach printers, how to interact with the customers, how to sell print to customers. Do you think that's that's needed more in the industry? Well, it, it was always available. However, COVID, COVID cut, <laughs> cut a lot of our legs off. You know, uh, I know Rob does road shows. We do road shows. We go out. But these aren't selling shows. These are these are teaching shows. We go out and educate, uh, educate the customer. We have a playroom for customers to come and play here. Rob has an innovation center for people to go play there. The problem with COVID was you people weren't getting together. And I think that's changing and I think it's a positive sign. So I think you'll see more of those things. There's actually a pent up demand for it. So I think you're going to find it's probably going to be overplayed for a while. But people want to interact and want to learn. So I, I think it'll come back. It's gone away, but it's not us that made it go away. It was basically the whole fear paradigm that made it go away. Um, and I just want to go through the questions and um, if something hasn't been answered or if one of the panelists would like to touch on something in one of the slides so long. Um, just a reminder to please answer our polls. Um, okay, so I see that that's been answered. Um, okay, let's just see. So I think um, one of the questions was um, from Sarah. She said, what would be your advice to printing companies that outsource, outsource their printing services as opposed to getting a loan to buy their own machinery during these tough times? The major issues with outsourcing is not being competitive price-wise, um, but the plus is the cost containment of not having large expenses like rent, paying back loans, fixed overhead. So I think she's trying to just get a balance of, um, you know, your advice to printing companies that outsource their printing services, as opposed to getting a loan to buying their own machinery. Um, I don't know who'd like to uh, touch on that. Um, okay, Rob? <laughs> That's uh, an interesting one. It's a numbers game. You know, we the number of times we've sat in meetings saying, okay, you're outsourcing, that's fantastic. The guy's doing a good job for you, that's even better. How many square meters a month are you outsourcing? What are you paying per square meter? If you invest in technology, this is what it's going to cost you per square meter. Yes, you need to set up a facility, you need power, you need water, you need you need operators, you need space, you need it, it's a bit of a no-brainer at a certain point. You know, it depends on what the volumes are. I haven't yet had a customer, and I doubt Bob would have, and, and certainly Grant, who's moved from an outsourcing business model to pulling it in-house, who after time has said, no, this is not working for me. I'm going back to outsourcing. It's, it, it's inconceivable to me that that would happen. Um, the challenge is uh, going to the bank and getting a loan to buy the equipment. And I see the top comment on that slide you've got on the screen. Again, be flexible in payment options and payment plans. 
And, and while people might think we're in control of that as suppliers, there's a limit to our resources. I mean, Midcomp is not a bank, Telpro is not a, a bank, and Fuji is not a bank. So we rely on working with other companies who are in the business of lending money. So if they have a, a, a risk aversion, it makes it very, very difficult. But again, if the numbers on paper look good in terms of what that outsourcing constitutes a month, if it's not in square meter terms, it can just be in rand terms. How much does somebody spend a month on outsourcing? That can be pulled in house. And why I said it was a catch 22 is because as soon as we do that, all of our bigger customers moan at us that we're putting too many plays into the market. You know, they wanna, they wanna keep that business for themselves. So we're caught between a rock and a hard place. Um, I see Bob enjoying that one again. That, we have this discussion almost on a daily basis with customers. We're putting too many machines into the market, but then you get people who would like to move outsourcing to in-house. And that's the bread and butter of our business um, on doing exactly that. So I think the challenge is setting up the facilities. We can help with you know, getting people to learn how to do the job properly. We can help with um, getting a loan from the bank to buy that piece of equipment. To some extent, we can, we can, help. We can help write business plans. But as I said earlier, banks have stopped looking at business plans. They look at affordability strictly. So that's the challenge for me is, is where does the money come from to enable that um, uh, pulling that uh, traditionally outsourced work in-house? Great, thank you, Rob. Megan, if I can just comment on that one. I think, I think it's important that banks, are, banks haven't really changed. I started my company with very little money, 45 rand to be exact. But who did I borrow from? I didn't borrow from the bank. I borrowed from family members. I borrowed from people around me and I promised to pay them back. And I think that's important that, that in this COVID time, one of the things that definitely would have come out is that families are pulled closer together. Families are far more supportive of each other. Talk to each other as a family member and an extended family on how to help each other to sustain your family, to sustain your business and go from there. Yes, one day you'll get to the point where you will go to the bank and then one day you'll get to the point where you don't like the banks anymore because you don't need them. That's a cycle we're all gonna go through. Can I, um, if I can just add something there, Bob, I agree with you 100%, except what we found, and I don't know if anybody else has experienced that, but a lot of our customers would have requested some sort of payment relief, whether it's on rental payments for their premises, whether it's on mortgage payments, whatever it might be, they've requested relief, and maybe even gone further and, and requested COVID loans from the bank, which the government did facilitate with the banks. Um, nobody was told at the time that this would impact negatively on your credit worthiness. And we've seen this time and time again. I know that company, they've, they've got a COVID loan, so no, we're not... We, we're not going to finance them. You know, they have changed by looking at your, your sort of lending history over the COVID period, and they're basing some of their decisions on, on, on whether you did or did not need help during that period. So, and it's not with all banks, so I, and I don't, want, I don't want to seem to be bank bashing, sorry, and, and I'm not going to be specific, but it, it's a problem. They do look at that negatively. If companies did take COVID loans, if they did apply for relief on, on certain payment structures with the banks, um, that counts negatively against you when you try and raise finance for, for anything else. It, it's, a, it's a fact. It's, it's unfortunate, but, but there it is. So you've got to have a really strong set of financials and balance sheet um, to overcome those hurdles if, um, you know, if you want the bank to, to, to be your partner. Thanks, Rob. And I mean, um, Hussein's just asked a question. I think this is obviously a really big um, um, or important topic. And um, you've probably touched on it uh, mostly, but Hussein's asking from how are suppliers innovating to sm uh, help small and medium enterprises to change the way they do rental packages to remove the contract pitfalls? Because, you know, given the context that you don't, you, you just said, you know, business, print businesses don't have all the resources to make this happen. So in terms of changing, you know, removing some contract pitfalls, um, are you guys innovating in that uh, respect? Uh, Rob's touched on this already. We are not the banks, unfortunately. We don't, we don't write the contracts. When, when you borrow from a rental company or you borrow from a bank, they write the contracts. So there's very little we can do other than appeal to them, which we do. Uh, we, we can't write the contracts. We're not bankers. We are high-tech suppliers. And if we got into banking, we'd probably make a mess of it. 
Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I mean, we on certain deals, we've been known to offer some form of recourse, which is like a buyback guarantee to a finance company. But we've got to be very confident in, in that business. Uh, and we need to be intimately involved with that business to make sure that that, that our risk is is mitigated. And, and uh, you know, we've had some good experiences and some bad experiences. So it is, as Bob said, we're not a bank. It's very difficult for us to, to make it easier other than appealing to the bank and the lending institutions to look at the bigger picture. Don't just look at an affordability model for the client. Look at what the technology is going to do for them and the growth that it's going to create in their business. And, and, and we win sometimes. Sometimes the bank will reconsider on that basis, but um, it, it's hard. And as Bob said, there's, only, there's a limit to what we can do to enable that, that process. Okay, great. Then, um, I mean, most of the questions have been answered. So I think just the one um, Rob and Bob have, have uh, answered this. So maybe I'll direct it firstly at Grant. Um, Grant, what would you like to see government enacting in order to ensure the industry's viability and sustainability? I think Rob and Bob have answered it perfectly. Um, okay. Sort of stay out of it, I guess, you know, because ultimately I mean, we, see, we see it all the time. Wherever they get involved, essentially, it just throws more red tape. It makes things more difficult. You know, there's more hurdles to jump over. So the reality is, you know, unless they're going to come into this with a more open, open-minded approach, uh, without all the legalities, then there's very little that they can do. I mean, I, I think if anything, all they'll do is hamstring, hamstring us even further. Um, and that's just based on, you know, the history of the way things run in this country and that's 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 as truthful as i can be um so i think we're going along fine i think you know it'd be lovely if there there was, was an investment from government that said you know what we're going to throw this at the industry we're going to throw this at training we're going to throw this because i think that's sorely lacking i think we try as an industry and then in the industry body certainly get involved in trying to help and facilitate that more and certainly us as fujiform as a corporate where that, that that's an area that we are focusing on now to see how we can get a little bit more involved with industry bodies to improve the training um you know across the board across the sectors that we work in um, um, but certainly, I think if there's anywhere that they could invest, and maybe when I say stay out of it, let's, let's throw some money at the industry in terms of training and in terms of investing in a small business, you know, new entrepreneurs, you know, it's, it's them that can probably take a little bit more risk and facilitate that risk mitigation with the banks that, uh, that we're talking to. Because certainly us as businesses, um, we don't have the power to influence the banks that much. We can assist and guide and help, but uh, we don't have that influence, unfortunately. So government has probably got a bit more power, but historically, um, you know, it comes with a lot more hurdles that we have to jump over. Okay, fantastic. So that wraps up our session. Um, thank you so much to our panelists and our sponsors, Fujiform, Falcon, Midcomp, and Roland. And thank you so much for our attendees for watching. The replay will be available and will be sent to you. Um, and we hope to see everyone at the Sign Africa Expo next week, 21st to 23rd uh, of April at Emperor's Convention mm -hmm. Center. Um, if you'd like a replay of this webinar, as well as other informative webinars, you can visit signafrica.com forward slash live. Thank you to everyone and take care. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.